The Spanish-American War claimed the lives of 3,000 Americans, but only a small fraction of those soldiers died in combat. Yellow fever and typhoid decimated entire units, swiftly spreading through camps in the Caribbean and southeastern United States. I'm Shannon, the podcast producer here at C-SPAN, and this week on the Lectures in History podcast, North Carolina State Professor Chris Laws teaches a class about North Carolina native Worth Bagley, who was the first U.S. soldier to die during the Spanish-American War in 1898. Stay tuned. Class starts right after this. This episode is brought to you by Health Carousel. If travel nursing has lost its allure, discover a better way at Health Carousel. They'll help you redefine your nursing journey and build your career with diverse assignments, clinical ladder programs, and work study options, all designed with your long term goals in mind. Don't just settle for another contract. Get the competitive pay, benefits, and full circle support you deserve so you can live and work the way you want. Find out more at hctravelnursing.com slash Spotify. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Commercial Insurance. Business owners, meet Progressive Insurance. They make it easy to get discounts on commercial auto insurance and find coverages to grow with your business. Quote in as little as six minutes at progressivecommercial.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company. Coverage provided and serviced by affiliated and third-party insurers. Discounts and covered selections not available in all states or situations. All right. Well, welcome uh, to another edition of North Carolina History. So this lecture today actually pairs well with what we're studying right now in the class. The turn of the 20th century in North Carolina, uh, the tumultuous 1890s, but uh, I'm sure you've heard me call every time period in North Carolina history tumultuous, but uh, this is no exception. So today's lecture is called Worth Bagley. The Southern Savior, Confederate Christ, Masculine Messiah. And we're actually going to dive into more of the topic of memory making. And so there are two types of memory. Um, and I'll, these, you may not be familiar with these terms yet. I'll go ahead and write them on the board. So official memory and vernacular memory. I think I spelled that right. Okay, so... What do you think official memory is? I don't expect you to know, so any guess would be great. Yeah? Something that's accepted by the government. Very good. So you use the word the state. It's a, it's a state narrative. It's the official narrative of the story. Like there's an official story of America. And, you know, 1776, the Constitution, and oftentimes these are used for consensus building. And in order to do that, you have to erase what's called a vernacular memory. And so uh, the word vernacular is chosen for a reason. What do you think this is? What do you think vernacular memory is? Cultural memory. I'm sorry? Cultural memory. Cultural memory. You ask, like, um, everyday people remember something or like a common kind of, whether it's true or not, kind of common thought about a specific kind of area. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's informed by personal experiences. So the way that we all see the world is not, there's not a consensus. We can take it, we can look at an event um, and all have different views on that event, right? Same thing is true for people who lived through the Civil War in North Carolina. They had different views. I mean, we've talked about in class how divided North Carolina was. There wasn't a consensus on what they even fought for. Shoot, that's continued through the modern day. So, but so what we're going to talk about is the crafting of an official memory of Worth Bagley that erases vernacular memories of the Civil War Reconstruction. Sound fun? All right. Well, let's go ahead and begin. So you may be wondering, when Worth Bagley was killed on May 11th, 1898, um, he was recognized as the first Southerner to die for the Stars and Stripes uh, in the United States in a war against a foreign power. The last time the United States had officially been at war with another country was 1846-1848 when they fought the Mexican-American War. So, okay, you have to think about this is decades. Decades have passed, and um, Bagley becomes a symbol for reconciliation between the North and the South and redemption. Okay, that's why I call him the Southern Savior, the Confederate Christ, the redemption for the South. Okay, Bagley's blood washed away quote, unquote, washed away the sin of secession, restoring the honor of the South within the Union, okay? And um, 
so moving along, that's just to kind of, you know, this, this is the, that's the end of the story right there, okay? He becomes this, this great hero that restores Southern honor within the Union. Now, he was born on April 6, 1874 in Raleigh, Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, to William H. Bagley and Adelaide Ann Worth. Bagley's and the Worth were two very prominent North Carolina families. Now, William Bagley had served in, in a, as a major in the Confederate Army and was appointed by Andrew Johnson after the war as to be the superintendent of the U.S. Mint in Charlotte. However, Bagley refused the post because of the required loyalty oath. A lot of Southern men refused to give this loyalty oath, and that's why they're excluded from government positions post-war. However, he did later serve as the clerk of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Um, now, Bagley's mother was the daughter of Jonathan Worth, who was the state treasurer. He had been in the General Assembly for a long time before the Civil War, and he was the first elected governor of North Carolina after the war. Um, and of course, defeated William Holden in that election. Um, now, Bagley's brother, William Bagley Jr., became the co-owner and the editor of the Raleigh Morning Post newspaper on May 10th, 1898. Turns out that's the day before Worth Bagley was killed. Uh, his brother is a newspaper man. You think that's going to play a role in how he's remembered? Absolutely. Furthermore, Bagley's brother-in-law was Josephus Daniels. Josephus, yeah, so Josephus Daniels, the, uh, the owner and editor of the News and Observer, which was the most widely circulated newspaper in North Carolina. It was also the, Demo the mouthpiece of the Democratic Party. Uh, in fact, Daniels Hall, that just down the road, was named after him until it, so, so it was just changed recently. Uh, Daniels, of course, played a very big role in starting the racial violence of, of uh, November 1898, Wilmington Massacre, and he played a big role in the, that racist and gendered campaign um, that saw the fusionists swept out of power in 1898, which, of course, when, when the, um, the Democrats came back to power, they changed the laws and really erased a lot of the um, the progress of the fusion movement, which is the, of course, the unprecedented alliance between black and white politicians. And we see after 1900, black people can't really vote in North Carolina. Um, so Josephus Daniels plays a big role in that. So Bagley, and he simply stated, Bagley is, comes from a very prominent North Carolina uh, family, and he's a man with a future. All right, he's got it all laid out in front of him. He's a man that has opportunity based on who he is, who his family is. Okay? Now, he was appointed to the U.S. Naval Academy in 1889 at the age of 15 years old. Um, at the academy, he was a standout on the football team. He was a man amongst boys. Uh, there's, a, there's a really good story about him when he played football for Navy. That's the picture right there. Um, during a, a game against the YMCA, Okay, they didn't have intercollegiate athletics like we do today, so they played the YMCA. He stopped a ball carrier from crossing the end zone, stood him up, took the ball from him, and ran 100 yards and scored a touchdown in one play. I mean, that would make, it, that would make you know, ES, ESPN's top 10, no problem. Um, and <laughs> the, man, the man's senior quote in his uh, Naval Academy yearbook was, Quote, I am not in the role of common men, unquote. Very sure of himself. Of course, uh, you might recognize that quote from your English class in high school. That's Shakespeare's Henry IV. Um, now, he graduated from the Academy in 1895 at the age of 21. And after his two-year cruise, he was promoted to the rank of ensign and assigned as a captain's clerk on the USS Maine. Y'all recognize the name of that ship? The one that blew up, but he, he was no longer on the main um, he was He became the executive officer of the torpedo boat Winslow, pictured there, um, in December of 1897, about two months before the main exploded. All right, let's see if this works. All right, so the Battle of Cardenas. Now, this is a map from a book by A.B. Fuhrer about the Spanish-American War. Great book. There are not a lot of really good books on this topic, so I... That's a, that's a really one. If you like narratives, battle narratives, this is a good one. Okay, so it kind of gives you a, 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 a picture that I'll, I'll talk about briefly. And this is the telegram uh, that announces Bagley's death to his family because they didn't have phones and 
text, you know, texting and whatnot. This was texting <laughs> through Morse code. Um, anyway, so the battle took place on May 11th, 1898 in Cardenas Bay, Cuba. The mission was to eliminate Spanish vessels that they had encountered three days before in the harbor. Okay, so the following information I'm about to tell you is from the official naval reports. Okay, because remember this lesson about crafting a public memory. This is what the official Navy record is. Okay, there are three channels to Cardenas Bay, and intelligence revealed that one of the three entrances was mined. Not sure which one. Okay, now the Winslow, a small torpedo boat, was sent in to make sure that it was safe for the larger USS Wilmington to follow through. Okay, they were joined by the USS Hudson in a three-pronged attack on the harbor. The Winslow took the flank at the eastern shore, and the Hudson on the west to prevent any type of escape from uh, the Spanish vessels that they had encountered the, day before, the days before. All right. Um, as the Wednesday closed and the sailors noticed several red buoys in the water, they thought they were for navigation purposes. But they were wrong. Turns out that they were guide buoys for artillery, heavy artillery. And so it's kind of like they're going in and it's a trap. <laughs> And so, um, with, the, and with the Winslow coming in here, they're the ones that got lit up first. And you can see they, got, they tried to backtrack to that little island there. Okay? The Winslow was severely damaged in this initial assault. Okay? They lost one of their engines and their rudder. And it's a, literally a rudderless ship. They cannot move. They're, they're just kind of drifting. They, can, they have one engine so they can kind of hobble, but this ship is almost dead in the water. Okay, they were able to hobble, back, hobble backwards, but um, the problem was they were drifting. They kept on drifting right into the Wilmington's line of fire. So they're getting fired on by the Spanish, and they're coming up a crossfire from their own friends. <laughs> so not a great situation. Um, Bagley's job during this fight was to go back and forth to communicate between the, uh, the deck and the engine room, uh, to coordinate the ship's movements, to try to keep it out of the way of the Wilmington. Now, while he was on one of his return trips, and the torpedo boat is not a big boat, um, so and this, this takes just a few minutes to go from the deck, see where you are, and then go back down and give orders on how, you know, how, how hard to fire the engine. And on one of his return trips, he stopped to look at this hell, hellish fury that's being unleashed by the Wilmington. Like, they're, they're bombarding the harbor. And he's like, wow. Um, and he also stops to talk to his commanding officer, uh, J.B. Bernadou. And he says to him, Captain, I'm sorry that you were wounded. I'm lucky in these things. To which his commanding officer replied, well, old man, we've been in a fight for sure this time. The two shook hands, and they turned directions. Bagley went back to um, walk to the forward area of the ship. Within a few seconds, bam! A Spanish shell strikes the deck of the Winslow, hits a seam in the rivets, goes up in the air, and explodes, killing Bagley instantly. All right. Now you see here some images from uh, that were in the media afterwards. Okay. Now in the media aftermath of Bagley's death. The newspapers romanticized the circumstances of his death to make it appear more of a manly hero. Um, this was also during, again, 1898. It's the height of the newspaper wars, yellow journalism, Hearst versus Pulitzer. In fact, you could argue that this war got started over yellow journalism with, um, uh, with the sensationalized story of the USS Maine. So it's not unusual for the media to embellish, even still today. But um, so there are inconsistencies in this story, okay? How Bagley died and what he was doing as he died. Now, keep in mind, uh, during this era, the 19th century, especially during the Civil War, there's this obsession with what's called Ars Moriendi, the good death, and, or the art of death, and, you know, have, and having a good death, being able to prepare yourself to die with dignity, to face God, um, and the problem is, in war, sometimes you get killed without the ability to prepare. 
And so this, was, this played a really big role in the Civil War and in, in, in the culture of the militaries. Like, you know, give my, write a letter to my folks back home. Be sure if, if I fall, tell my family where you buried me and whatnot. And so the problem is Bagley didn't have this. And this is a tradition that came, you know, continued through uh, the Spanish-American War. So Bagley doesn't have the time to prove his manhood before his death, right? And so the, the newspapers gave him that opportunity, right? So some of the myths surrounding Bagley's death, okay? One of the myths was as the, after the shell exploded, he staggered by being struck by the blast. He grabbed onto the flag. The stars and stripes, and his blood got on the flag. And he clutched it as he died, and as he was dying, he whispered, Mother and my country. Okay, and he was, his grip was so hard on the flag that his comrades had to literally pry it out of his cold, dead hands. It's a great story, right? Why? Why come up with a story like that? Just think about that. We're going, to come, we're going to come back to that. Okay. Of course, though, that contradicts um, Bernard Dew's official report and the letter that he wrote to Bagley's brother that said that Bagley was killed instantly by the blast. He said that he was the first to reach um, Bagley and that he opened up his shirt and realized very quickly that he had ceased to live. Right? There was no staggering. There was no my country. He was just dead. Okay? Uh, another interesting story, a man came forward in the press in a letter to Josephus Daniels 18 years after the battle and said that he had caught Worth Bagley and kept him from falling over the side of the ship. And that as Bagley was dying, he put his hand on his shoulder and said, thank you, the gentleman that he was, right? And he, and he died with no cry of pain or complaint. Okay, so there was some discrepancy in, about the injuries that Bagley received. I mean, injuries to the other casualties were very gruesome. Uh, a man named Elijah Tunnel, who was an African American cook on the ship, reportedly had his legs blown off, according to some sources. However, this is disputed because the newspapers of the day claimed that he had no wounds. Um, Edward Austin uh, Johnson's book uh, about black Americans' participation in the Spanish-American War claimed that his legs were completely blown off. And um, John Vervaris had his windpipe severed. John Dempsey had his shoulder torn open by shrapnel. Now, the newspaper claimed that ba Bagley's face had been completely blown off. Imagine being his mother and hearing that before, uh, before uh, seeing him when they brought him home. That was not the case. When they actually brought his body home to his house, he had a scratch on his, his face, and that was it. Okay, um, And because he didn't have any other like visible wounds, we can assume that he was killed by the concussive force of the blast. It's not, it's not, if you're not killed by the shrapnel of the blast, you're killed by the concussive force, the air pressure, going and, and just messing up your organs. All right? So that, that cannot be true. All right? Uh, let's, we're going to believe Bernadou's report. All right. Um, another another uh, controversy is what was he doing? Okay. Well, what was he ordered to do? He was ordered to go back and forth between the deck and the engine room to coordinate the movements of the hobbled movements of the Winslow to keep it out of the line of fire. That's a very important job. Will we agree about that? We're going to make sure that we don't <laughs> drift into the water and get lit up by our, by our own allies, right? Very important job, okay? Is the most manly job? Is it the most heroic job? Well, let's look at some of the myths, okay? So some of the myths that were printed in national media said that Bagley fell at his gun while bravely resisting the attack of the enemy and expired under the folds of the flag he had sworn to defend. All right? So... This account was printed, you know how like they have AP articles that are printed in all kinds of newspaper articles. Somebody wrote it, staff writer, and they just send it out. Same thing. They just had to, you know, to telegraph them. They're wire reports. So let me, I'm going to read this one to you, okay? It says, up to this time, um, with the exception of one shot, 
which had disabled the boiler of the Winslow, the firing of the Spanish gunboats, had been wild. But as the Winslow ray lay rolling in the water, the range grew, grew closer and the shells began to explode all around her. It was difficult for the Hudson to get near enough to throw a line to the Winslow's crew. So terrible the fire about her. Finally, after 20 minutes, the Hudson approached near enough to throw a line. Ensign Bagley and six men were standing in, her, in a group of, on the deck of the Winslow. Heave her, heave her, heave her, shouted Bagley as he looked toward the Hudson and called for a line. Don't miss it, shouted the officer from the Hudson. And with a smile, Bagley called back, let her come. It's getting too hot for comfort. The line was thrown and the same, at the same instant a shell burst in the very midst of the group of men aboard the Winslow. Bagley was instantly killed and a few others dropped also about him. Half a dozen more fell groaning on the blood-stained deck. One of the dead men pitched over headlong to the side of the boat. His feet caught the iron rail and he was hauled back. Bagley lay stretched on the deck, his face completely torn away, and the upper part of his body shattered. All right, well, let's unpack those. Okay, so he's been ordered to go communicate between the deck and the engine room. So that where he was, and this is, this is the photo of the alleged gun that he was at, the battle is taking place on this side of the boat. So if he's at this gun, what does he have to do? He has to shoot across the deck on that little gun. It's not really effective use of his time. If he fired his gun, it was in vain, right? But again, that would have been a, that would have been a dereliction of duty according to Bernadou, his commanding officer's um, orders through his official uh, account. All right, so we have that. We also have the story where he is killed trying to catch the tow line, right? But that contradicts what the official report says. But so why do they have this story printed about, and I want Chuck I told you to think about this, why do we have the story being printed that shows him at his gun, killed at his gun, or killed trying to catch a tow line? What do you think about that? Any thoughts? Gives them a more heroic story. More heroic story. And a better death. And a better death. Very good. More heroic story, better death. Okay? Very good. Very good. So, re regardless, though, of whether these accounts are deliberately romanticized or not, it's what the public consumed. In 1898, there's no Google, no, no way to easily fact check, right? So this is what the public consumed. This is how they knew that Bagley died. All right? So let's talk about Warcraft. And you can see here, yeah, the torpedo boat is small, but it's not that small. <laughs> it's not that small. Okay? But again, you see the, the, you know, the kill by the blast, and he's gripping the flag. Right? That, image, that imagery was, was created by design. Okay? All right, so let's talk about, if you're wondering what this, this is, this is the book that Josephus Daniels printed. He, he, you know, he's, a, he's a very good uh, journalist, he's a good writer, and he basically wrote the biography of his brother-in-law shortly after his death, and they sold it. Okay, this, these copies of this book were sold all over the country. But immediately after his death, and you're going to find that the majority of what makes Bagley's story interesting happens after he's put in his grave. Right. This episode is brought to you by Health Carousel. If travel nursing has lost its allure, discover a better way at Health Carousel. They'll help you redefine your nursing journey and build your career with diverse assignments, clinical ladder programs, and work study options, all designed with your long term goals in mind. Don't just settle for another contract. Get the competitive pay, benefits, and full circle support you deserve so you can live and work the way you want. Find out more at hctravelnursing.com slash Spotify. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Commercial Insurance. Business owners meet Progressive Insurance. They make it easy to get discounts on commercial auto insurance and find coverages to grow with your business. Quote in as little as six minutes at progressivecommercial.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company. Coverage provided and serviced by affiliated and third-party insurers. Discounts and covered selections not available in all states or situations. 
Now, immediately after his death, reconciliation of sentiments flooded both the northern and the southern press. Okay, this is a quote from the Boston Tribune. The North mourns the South's loss as the Union's loss and extends sympathy to North Carolina, whose hero was the first to fall in defense of the stars and stripes. Ensign Bagley's bravery and fearlessness of life for our country has shown the world that sectionalism no longer exists. Okay, the Philadelphia Press printed, a southern state gave the first victim under the flag of a reunited country. Okay, the New York Tribune, an intensely Republican newspaper, all right, says, quote, with his blood, he has sealed the union of arms of the North and South. A people who once fought against the Stars and Stripes send one of their sons as the first sacrifice for the honor and glory of that flag. There is no North and South after that. We are all Worth Bagley's countrymen, unquote. We also see tributes and wreaths from the Grand Army of the Republic organizations. Y'all know who that was? The Grand Army of the Republic? Those are Union Civil War veteran groups. So they're sending their, because remember, Bagley is a son of the Confederacy. His father was a major in the Confederate Army. His grandfather was part of the Confederate government, right? So we see tributes and wreaths come from them as well as also Confederate veterans groups. So this new memory that was purposefully designed says that Bagley's blood paid for the South secession during the Civil War. It was his restored Southern honor and manhood. But perhaps more importantly, it gave Southerners another opportunity to embrace and honor their Confederate past, as Bagley was the son of a Confederate veteran. The South had a new hero that they could openly commemorate, which took away some of the sting of losing the Civil War. They were finally on the winning side after decades of being on the losing one. Now, after, after the Civil War, you see a lot of um, Southerners, North Carolinians in particular, uh, start to get really obsessed with commemorating the Revolutionary War. Why do you think that was? Any, any thoughts? Why would they want to commemorate the Revolutionary War and not the Civil War that they had just fought? Let me back that up. They did want to commemorate that. They weren't allowed to. Um, they ever heard, what, what about the Mecklenburg Resolves? You heard of the Mecklenburg Resolves? No? Yes? Okay, so the Mecklenburg Resolve. Mecklenburg County is the first group of Americans to declare independence from, uh, from England. So North Carolina, and then also the Battle of Alamance, the Regulator Movement, the first shots fired for liberty. They, North Carolinians were very proud of their, their revolutionary heritage and said, like, look, we're loyal to the Union. Look what we did for the Union. All right? But they're having to look generations back to find that, 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 um, that heritage of Americanness that they can celebrate. Right? Bagley has given them one they can celebrate in the contemporary day. A Southern man, a North Carolinian, has died for the Stars and Stripes. That proves our loyalty. Right? And you know, Northerners are actually okay with this. Bagley's sacrifice had demonstrated patriotism and loyalty to the United States. And the majority of Northern whites were envious of the romanticized antebellum Southern culture during the 1890s. And you'd be like, well, why is that the case? Well, the North in particular is experiencing a lot of social and political changes during the 1890s uh, that came with the influx of immigrants. Uh, the turn of the 20th century, also the women's rights movement, the great migration of African Americans from the South to the North. So there's a lot of change going on. And so a lot of white Northerners long for the good old days where everyone knew their place. And I am saying that very tongue-in-cheek quotation marks, right? So that's why the, the story Gone with the Wind was so popular in the 20th century, right? It's, it's, it's a romanticized time period. They just didn't mention slavery there. Um, so yeah, so Northerners are okay with Bagley being celebrated. However, while Southerners had likened Bagley to the, as the uh, Henry Lawson Wyatt um, of the Spanish-American War, and for those of you who don't know him, he's traditionally seen as the first man to die for the Confederacy. 
He's also from North Carolina. Uh, Northerners preferred to view him as the Elmer Ellsworth of the Spanish-American War. And Ellsworth was remembered as the first Union officer uh, killed in the Civil War, shot while removing the Confederate flag from a building um, in Alexandria, Virginia on May 24, 1861, uh, which is the day that Virginia voted on their secession ordinance. Likening Bagley to a Union hero was a clear attempt, though, to delineate Bagley from his Confederate heritage. So there was some like, he's like, yeah, he's the Henry Lawson Wise. Like, yeah, we prefer to see him as the Elmer Ellsworth of, of this war, right? But regardless, regardless, um, both sides agree that he is an American hero. And shortly after Bagley's death, Congress removed the disqualification clause from the 14th Amendment. Do y'all know what that is? The disqualification clause? So this was a clause that was put into the 14th Amendment, one of the Reconstruction Amendments, that barred any ex-Confederates from holding office in the federal government. Those, you know, those who were participating in rebellion um, could, not, could no longer hold office. So um, Southern newspaper editors, way before Bagley's, um, Bagley's death, had been arguing for years that um, the disqualification clause had created an atmosphere where Southern men were prevented from advancing in the armed services, that there was a discrimination of Southern men because of this, this law. Okay, in fact, the Atlanta Journal uh, ran an opinion piece in the weeks before Bagley's death that highlighted Bagley as an up-and-coming Southern officer in the Navy, and one of the reasons why the disqualification clause should be removed. Okay, um, now... Why is this an issue? This is an issue because of 19th century manhood. Um, martial duty is a big part of that. And so if they can't serve and can't rise to the ranks, then how does a Southern man prove his manhood? Right? Now, it also reveals that the South is looking for heroes to celebrate. Okay? Now, after Bagley dies, this, this, uh, there's a bill that's brought up before Congress that would remove the disqualification clause. Okay, during discussion of the bill, North Carolina Congressman Romulus, and, uh, Romulus Lenny called Bagley, quote, one of the grandest patriots and noblest soldiers of the United States. Okay, and that received thunderous applause in the um, House chambers. He added, quote, the example of Worth Bagley is the standard that my state has set for courage and devotion to principle. We simply invite other states to come up to that standard. I have no doubt all the soldiers of all the states of the Union, from Mississippi to the state of Washington, will do all they can to come up to the high standard of Worth Bagley, unquote. And so, yes, the disqualification clause was removed, and Worth Bagley's name was used to, as justification to do that. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. How old was he when he died? Well, he was born in 1874, and he died in 1898. So that's 24. 24, okay. Yes. Young well, man. Yeah. Young man. <laughs> but he was the, he saved America. <laughs> right? But it, just show, it shows when you sit back and look at like the reality versus the myth that's created. And, and why is the myth being created? It's to, a, it's to further political agendas. Long-seated political agendas. Right? They were just waiting for an opportunity. And Worth Bagley's death provided that. Okay, so let's talk about something, uh, a little different idea. Worth Bagley's body as a monument. So what's a monument? Usually like a statue dedicated to someone. Right, it's a, it can take the form of a statue dedicated to someone. It's a physical site of memory, right? It stands for a principle, it stands for a person, an event, okay? I argue that Bagley's body became a monument. Now the question is a monument to what? After his death, his body was taken from Cuba to Key West, Florida, where it was embalmed, and he received a small funeral attended by mainly his comrades in the Navy. Um, Bagley's body was the only one who was killed during this battle to be embalmed, as the other fallen comrades were buried in Key West next to the victims of the USS Maine. Okay, after his funeral, Bagley's body was taken to Jacksonville and put on a train to return home to Raleigh. His coffin was covered with an American flag. You can see the picture right there. American flag and ornately decorated with flowers and pieces of his uniform, including his sword. At nearly every train stop along the route, Southerners, mostly upper-class white women, met the train and left flowers. 
wreaths and gifts, hoping to catch a glimpse of the hero. In these moments, we see Bagley's body transformed into a monument to American patriotism and white Southern manhood, okay, as people came to worship at this altar. Keep in mind, they had been on the losing side of, this, of a war for the last 30 years. So this is a chance that they get to celebrate being on the winning side and being on the American side, all right? Um, the, the tributes became so immense that they actually had to stop, physically stop people from leaving flowers. Um, I'm sure it smelled wonderful. Um, but anyway, so Bagley's body was brought to the family home, South Street in Raleigh, still exists today. Um, and he arrived in the, in the middle of the night and honor guard stood in the family parlor and guarded his body all night long. Okay, then in the morning it was removed to the state capitol where he laid in state. Um, at the Capitol Rotunda. It's honor reserved for very few. Um, and again, uh, according to the newspaper reports, thousands and thousands of people came to view the body, uh, or you know, view his coffin, not his body, not out of the casket. Um, and his body became a physical site of memory um, to remember old ideals that were not necessarily present in the post-war South. Remember, the South has spent years resisting federal reconstruction. And for a lot of white Southerners, um, they felt that they didn't have much reason to feel patriotic. As they held on to, the, to this attitude that they had been occupied by a foreign power. Okay, in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, North Carolinians who wanted to reconcile with their American heritage had to reach back, like I said before, into the distant past. Now they get to reach out and basically touch their present. And it's on, it, they're, again, they're on the winning side. They could celebrate their own Southern Raleigh's own American hero. Okay. Now these are pictures from Bagley's funeral, the largest in state history, still true today. Okay. He was given the honors of a brigadier general. An estimated 3,000 people were in the funeral procession alone, not to mention the thousands that gathered to, uh, around the Capitol Square who lined the streets of the parade route and who also attended his burial at Oakwood Cemetery, and there were lots of hills then around the cemetery. Not the case today. All right. Um, as you can see in this picture, Bagley's body is placed um, right underneath the statue of George Washington. You think that's symbolic in any way? Absolutely. Okay, George Washington considered the father of the country, the American country. And so, again, this is him. Uh, it, you know, everything was, was very meticulously designed. Um, a lot of, a lot of the, the, the important things about his funeral are all visual, not necessarily rhetoric. Okay? Um, you see a lot of reconciliationist imagery throughout this ceremony. Um, there aren't significant speeches that were made during Bagley's funeral. Uh, there was not even a substantial eulogy about his life. Um, politicians were present, but there was no chest thumping. Say, oh, what a great, brave man Bagley was. That would come later, but not in this moment. Everything was about the visual, um, the visual uh, elements of reconciliation, sight, sound, not, not rhetoric. Okay, so to give you some examples um, of what you would have seen had you been there, you would have seen... A Raleigh police officers leading the parade, followed by the 1st North Carolina Regiment Band, uh, playing funeral dirges, followed by the Governor's Guard, and then followed by clergy and family and then close friends. Very normal for a military funeral, okay, of this era. That's, that's not unusual. Here are the unusual elements of, um, for an officer of Bagley's rank, he's an ensign, okay, uh, High-ranking naval officials came, including the civilian ones that are appointed by the, the, the executive branch, right? Um, 2,000 soldiers from the 1st and 2nd North Carolina Volunteer Regiments, cadets from North Carolina A&M Co &M College. Y'all know where North Carolina A&M is? You're sitting in it. <laughs> NC State. NC State. Now, again, those are, that's special because that's, that's atypical for somebody of Bagley's rank. That's something you would expect for a brigadier general. All right. The highly unusual, uh, you have mem members of the Lawrence O'Brien branch camp of the Confederate veterans marching side by side in uniform, their gray uniforms, 
with members of the Ge General George H. Thomas Post of the Grand Army of the Republic. So what you have is you have Confederate soldiers in uniform marching next to Union soldiers in uniform. You didn't see that often. Okay. So the people of Wal Raleigh witness a visual representation of reconciliation. What this does, it erodes at the old vernacular memories and lived experiences of the Civil War Reconstruction era. Okay? The Civil War is over. You can see that they're, they're marching side by side under a single flag, the American flag. Okay? What that does is kind of, kind of make you forget about the, div the divided nature of North Carolina during the Civil War. In fact, we, what did I call my, my lecture on North Carolina in the Civil War? The Civil War, North Carolina. The Civil War, the Civil War, North Carolina, right? Because North Carolinians were very, very divided on that issue. And so you start to see that kind of pushed away out of the official memory, right? Okay, we also see 1,200 students from Raleigh's graded schools in the procession. And so why would you see children marching in this funeral parade? What do you, why do you think? They'll be the ones... Bring, or um, passing along the memories. It's important to us to distill those memories. Yeah, memories and also values, right? This is what manliness looks like. Worth Bagley is someone you should emulate. Yes? How, how do they go from this, where North Carolina is celebrating... This kind of reconciliation, rah rah, United States, we didn't do it with the Civil War. To within, we know within a few years they're going to start putting Civil War monuments up everywhere. Right, that was already starting to happen. Yeah. At this, how, how do they reconcile, or how do they explain the the two? How I'll can you explain be, that? Okay. I'll explain that in a few okay. minutes um, to hold on to that question. But yeah, that you, that you're right. It, it yeah, becomes very. It is weird. It's weird. It yeah. is weird. It's a fun, it's a weird phenomenon. It's yeah. uh, it's very America. Southern American <laughs> phenomenon. But, I mean, we, we also, but we also yeah. see Confederate monuments in Union states as well. So yeah. it's interesting. There's a book called Creating Confederate Kentucky. Of course, Kentucky did not join the Confederacy, but after the war, a lot of their memory was rooted in Confederate lore. So um, but yeah, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Any other questions? Yes. Is he still buried there? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can go visit. He's right. If you go up the hill from the Confederate cemetery, you'll see him. And that's his grandfather right there, Jonathan Ward. Okay. Yes. For the turnout for this, do you think that it would have been the same had he not been related to someone that was in the press, multiple avenues? Absolutely. I, I think that's so, that definitely played a role in this. Okay. And, and, yeah. And so, what? It, because he, he is a, he is a man of that social cast. Yeah. Um, he he was afforded opportunities that probably wouldn't was definitely not afforded to the other. Men who died, right. and the um, so it wasn't and that like people stateside were kind of just looking for the first person to die and to create this. <laughs> no, in fact, we're not even sure if he was the first person to die. That's what. This oh, is. that's yeah. the same. I mean, he's the first. Now we do know he's the first line officer to die yeah. in this war, and you know, and there's other evidence he's too, not like only, isn't he? Because I mean, there was four. So no, there was there was another one in the army. Yeah. Uh, okay. So and he was actually from North Carolina. We'll talk about him too, but um. He's young. He's very, very young. young. But then they create this. Very young. Well, it's like marketing, right? It's like they're, they're creating this atmosphere, like you said, with all these visual. I mean, that's just. And it's intentional. It's, it's a commercial. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. meant to be politicized. It's yeah. meant to accomplish a goal. Yeah. It's and that's to, you know, to, you know, reassert the South's place. And, and that's what North, you know, Northerners understood at this time period. They needed the South because this is a time of empire building in order for America to become an empire. Uh, comparative to England or France, yeah. they needed the South and the South's material, the South's labor, and so yeah, we see we see that desire to yeah it, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, but yeah, there, you know another guy uh, George, um, George Meeks who also died in this battle, he was given a statue by the state of Ohio, and they go and they unveil the statue, and it looks nothing like him, and so the George Meeks sister confronts the governor of Ohio and said, this looks nothing like my brother. He's like, it's not meant to. It's, just, it's meant to represent an American sailor during the Spanish-American War. So that just shows that, you know, the, the, the privilege of his class and status, right? That's a great question. I don't, I, no, I do not believe that had he not been who 
he was related to that he would have got this. Um, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Next to the Just person. asking how do we get that deal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, speaking of monuments, let's talk about the Worth Bagley monument that's still on the Capitol grounds today. So almost immediately after the news hit of Worth Bagley's death, there were calls to erect a monument. This is during the period of memorial mania. Uh, where there was a deep obsession, especially in the South, with preserving memories of people, events, ideals, and public spaces. Um, now, calls to erect monuments and memorials were not limited to North Carolina. We see um, it calls to it, it, it elect, uh, erect a monument in Washington, D.C., with the other big monuments put him right next to the Washington Monument. Um, that's what they were trying to create. This kid was a saying, like, he would have been on Mount Rushmore. You know, that's what you, you know. Um, individual states like Tennessee, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania all started um, moves to build statues to Worth Bagley. Very interesting. Um, they never materialized, but the discussion happened. Um, now, we do see memorials appear at the U.S. Navy Academy. That, that is appropriate, right? This is where he's, you know, he graduated from. And um, it's interesting to note Boston's Spanish American War Veteran Society. They named their chapter after Worth Bagley. Again, pretty appropriate. I mean, he was, you know, he was a line officer killed in the war. And, you know, that, that is significant. This episode is brought to you by the all-new 2024 Toyota Grand Highlander. Being the parent in charge of the neighborhood carpool can be intimidating. But with the 2024 Grand Highlander's more spacious third row, you can be confident of the space you're in. Confident enough to handle five kids, even if you don't understand when they say things like w Riz. Learn more at ExploreSEToyota.com. Toyota, let's go places. The most exciting part of a vacation stay at a home rental? Easy. It's being greeted upon arrival with a rusted lockbox affixed to the underside of a stranger's condo. Yeah, you simply twist knobs, click gears, jiggle it, and then rip it off its moorings, and voila! Your prize is a key to a questionable home rental and maybe tetanus. When you just want to get your vacation started by actually getting into your room, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we deliver your key right to your phone on the Hilton Honors app. Hilton, for the stay. Now, Raleigh businessman N.W. West, who was also very involved in Confederate veteran groups, suggested that the Morning Post, remember the Morning Post was owned by Bagley's brother. Not very long, but it, but it, just, you know, it just changed hands. He said, we got to start a Worth Bagley Monument Fund. And he originally wanted to seed the fund with $100. That's a good sum of money in 1898. Um, but he was convinced that it should be a popular subscription fund, a, a monument built by the people. And people should give a dollar or less, and then they'll have um, their names attached, not literally, but figuratively attached to the monument. And they'll print the names in the newspaper and how much you gave. All right? So it's really a, like a community crowdsource um, type fundraising event. They, they, and they wanted to have it a monument built by the people because they wanted to make it a reconciliationist tool. They wanted, again, erode more vernacular memories and create a new consensus official memory about not just Worth Bagley, but Southern manhood and, and, their, and loyalty to the Union. Okay? So in, like I said, exchange, in exchange for donations, you got your name printed in the newspaper, um, and you just got the public, the notoriety of doing that. So let, what I did is I went back and looked at all this data because they did a really good job of printing this stuff in the newspaper every day for a long time. And so what we see here is people gave very, very quickly initially, $800 in the first week, $1,500 by the end of June, $2,000 by the end of the first week of July. Okay, it's also interested to see who is giving to this monument fund. Um, of course, you have the wealthy white uh, political elite, the titans of industry, you know, the Washington Dukes, the Julian Cars. Um, but it's also, you start to see the rank and file of Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina communities. But um, you also see black communities donating to this monument. Booker T. Washington, who's the principal of the Tuskegee Institute and one of the most prominent black intellectuals of the 19th century, um, gave a dollar to this fund and said, Quote, I feel it to be the duty of Negro citizens as well as white citizens to contribute to this patriotic fund, unquote. Of course, this fits in with Washington's constructionalist approach to politics, befriending white leaders in order to gain access to resources that would uplift black communities. 
Um, and Washington also donated and supported building Confederate monuments and monuments to former Confederate generals that he had befriended. Um, so this is not out of, you know, this is not off brand for Washington. But we also see um, people who subscribe to Washington's politics, like Durham's black elite, the, the men who built Black Wall Street, they also t donated to the fund. We see the uh, children of Raleigh's colored grading schools also collect. Uh, they pulled their pennies to get together and donated a dollar. So contributions from black residents and institutions are very significant because it reveals the memory narrative that they believe they were contributing towards a reunified country that they would have a place in building moving forward. Okay. Now, it turns out the fund ended up falling short. Okay. And so let me show you another slide. Okay. This is the total, uh, this is the dollar amount over a given period of time. So the, this graph kind of indicates, and maybe the rank and file didn't necessarily buy into the memory of worth Bagley, right? It's, you know, they accept, oh, it sounds great, but do I want to give my money to it? Um, so there were a total of 2,384 contributions made to the fund between May and the end of September 1898. For comparison, the 1900 census lists the population Raleigh uh, at 13,643. So the number of contributions represents 17% of just the city of Raleigh. Now, again, this was marketed as a North Carolina fundraiser, even a national fundraiser. And so, that's, I mean, that's very small. That's very small. Okay, during the per that period, um, we see, and let me go back to this slide to illustrate this. During that period, the average daily number of contributions was 22.92, it's almost 23. A day, average daily dollar amount was twenty two seventy nine. So at first glance, it's like, oh yes, this was clearly a popular subscription monument because nobody's giving more than a dollar, right? But you can see that's not the case. Okay, Con number of contributions is in blue. The day's total is in red. So initially, yes, people were sticking to that dollar. But then, what do you see happen here? Big gifts, right? Big gifts. Um, now, there was also significant in, uh, events. Nothing ever happens in a vacuum. And did the Spanish-American War last a long time? No, just a few months. And so there are other events that might have influenced the fund's growth, or lack thereof, in 1898. First, July 1st, Lieutenant William E. Shipp of North Carolina became the first Army officer killed during the Spanish-American War. He died leading a charge at the Battle of Santiago. That kind of complicates the narrative about Worth Bagley. Because what was Bagley doing when he died? He was walking away from his <laughs> officer. I mean, but the, the public you know, was consumed a different story, right? But he died leading troops up the hill. That's a man, right? So we're told. Yeah. Maybe he was going to the bathroom. <laughs> I doubt it. Um, that wouldn't have been an appropriate time. So, but again, it complicates Bagley as the Southern savior, right? And it complicates it's Bagley's exceptional because this guy did the same thing. Is Bagley really exceptional? All right, now the Bag Bagley Monument Fund actually publicly lobbied for people to donate to the Ship Monument as well. Okay, and that, that monument's actually built and it was put up at the U.S. Mint in Charlotte. Now on July 18th, which is around here, Look what happens. Start to see the flat line, right? July 18th was the end of the Siege of Santiago, which resulted in American victory and the outcome of the war no longer in doubt. So the excitement of the war is now over. And, and it was a war that North Carolinians generally weren't very excited about anyway. Volunteer rates are very low. So we could argue that Bagley's you know, memory was created to foster recruitment numbers. Um, but anyway, July 18th, war is over, and we see the fund flatlined. Okay. Now, there are too many data anomalies to consider this a real popular subscription fund, but, um, but we need to also take a look at the number of accounted funds versus the final cost of the monument. Now, the Morning Post printed its last regular update, which was daily, on September 24th, 1898, and noted that they had completed 
uh, I'm sorry, collected $2,316.70. They did not print another update until March 30th, 1901. It's a long time. So why that long? Well, on that day, Bagley's commanding officer, uh, John Bernadou, made a $100 donation to the fund, bringing the fund to, to $2,830, which was an increase of $413.30. So, that's, you know, where did that money come from? If it, was, if it was donated by popular subscription, wouldn't they have been printing their names? No, it's probably people were, you know, they're soliciting donations from private citizens, probably wealthy citizens, and we're kind of ashamed that more people weren't supporting this, all right? Now, um, the last update came on July 18th, 1905, which put the fund at $3,300. Now, it's not out of the realm of possibility this was popular subscription that raised about an average of 35 cents a day. But if that's the case, like I said, why are, they no, why are there no updates? Why are the names not printed in the, in the paper, which they did with fidelity for so long? Okay, it's probably from wealthy donors. The monument cost $11,000, so there's also a deficit in what the Morning Post reported was the size of the fund and the cost. The lack of the fund coverage indicates that the fund didn't do well. It's certainly not as well as the founders had hoped. Further evidence supporting this conclusion comes from an article from the Greensboro Patriot printed about two weeks before the monument's unveiling, which said that, quote, the purse which constituted the bulk of several thousand dollars has since been added several thousand dollars through other sources, unquote. Now, we do know that public money did not pay for this monument. Um, so it had to come from private donors. And again, if it's popular subscription, you would print the names of those people to give them recognition. All right, other claims about the nature of the, of the fund were just simply not true. In the days before the monument's dedication, Josephus Daniels wrote that the monument had been, quote, funded by hundreds of people from half the republic. Wow. That's a lot of folks. Well, if you look at this chart, they did receive donations from 20 states. There were 45 states in the Union at the time of the dedication cer uh, ceremony. But most of the states and territories, including this claim, had fewer than five donations. Eight of them had a single donation. So let's look at this claim. <laughs> half the states and half the republic. I mean, that, I'm sorry, what do you say? Hundreds of people from half the republic. Very misleading. And I'll tell you right now, the folks, these 43 folks right here, they were all uh, military officers and politicians in Washington, D.C. Okay, so, and most of these folks, like Virginia has a very big naval presence, um, and most of these were his buddies and just in naval families. So They're using Bagley to kind of promote this idea of Southern manhood, Southern bravery. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's weird. It is weird. Yeah. It is very weird. And so, but again, you know, memory doesn't have to make sense. Okay, so based, uh, and, and I'm sorry, um, there's no way we can seriously claim that this is a national monument. Um, now, during the dedication ceremony on May 20th, 1907, North Carolina's Governor Robert Brodnax Glenn claimed uh, that the Bagley Monument was a gift, quote, of behalf of more than 11,000 people. Well, it, it cost $11,000, but 11,000 people did not donate to this monument, okay? But at this time, in, 19, in 1907, there is no way to fact check any of this. So this is what's consumed by the public. It's, what's, it's what people take home after hearing. It's like, man, 11,000 people gave to this monument, you know? It, it's not. It, it's really not. But then the newspapers print this, and they call it a national, but there's no way to go back and fact check it like we could today. Okay, so it's part, it becomes part of this official memory that is handed down to the people of Worth Bagley. Let's talk about this dedication ceremony. That's an actual photo from, uh, you can actually still stand on this balcony at the state capitol and, and oversee where this happened. All right, let's look at the guest list of the ceremony. Okay, the Monument Association invited President Theodore Roosevelt, who politely declined, John Bernadou, who was now a captain in the U.S. Navy before he was a lieutenant. And yes, I did call him captain, but that was the person in charge of the boat is called the captain, regarding of the, regardless of the rank. Um, but he was on a deployment elsewhere in Rome, so he was not able to attend. Now, Victor Blue was a native North Carolinian who won fame as a national hero 
for going behind enemy lines to get reconnaissance on the location of the Spanish fleet. fleet. He was invited as a guest speaker. So he is one of the heroes of the Spanish-American War as well, um, again, marketed by the media, and he's from North Carolina. You have William Ship's widow and family attending. Richard Pearson Hobson was invited to be the, the main orator. He was a native Alabaman born of North Carolina parents, and he became a national hero because of his mission on the USS Merrimack, which called for him to purposefully sink the ship to trap enemy vessels in a harbor. Okay, now this mission was a, an absolute failure, but it was deemed a suicide mission. Um, but he was captured by Spanish forces, but no, nonetheless, he was still elevated to celebrity status after the war. In fact, for a period of time, Richard Pearson Hobson was known as the most kissed man in America. All right, he was also a he had been elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and was a rising star in the Democratic Party. Okay, now again, no public funding went into this monument or its dedication, so it all it was all raised privately. And so they formed a com canvassing committee to go door to door to ask for donations to hold the ceremony. Okay, they did they specifically did not solicit in Southwest or Southeast Raleigh. Okay? It's interesting to note. They, they didn't even solicit the South Street area where Bagley was formed. Why? Because these were predominantly black neighborhoods. But wait a minute, black people had supported the Worth Bagley Monument in 1898, right? Well, a lot had happened. In that well, one in 1898, by November, the fusionists had been you know, voted out of office, and we have the Wilmington Massacre in 1898, and then in 1900, the, gen uh, the General Assembly. Um, basically makes it impossible for black people to register to vote, essentially removing them from the body politic. Okay, this is another example of active exclusion. Okay, but it's interesting because Bagley, he grew up right on, on South Street, which is adjacent to Shaw University, the state's oldest HBCU. He grew up playing with black kids whose parents were at the university. So... He grew up in a, in a, in a, in a mixed-race environment. In fact, if we go back and look at the funeral, you see African-American people have attended. Did y'all notice that? So it's possible they would have been willing to contribute to this. But again, it just shows what type of memory they're crafting in this process. Okay? It's possible that the people, that the canvassing committee felt that the people in these areas would not be interested in participating, um, but it's more probable that they were actively excluded. It is a fact that white supremacists had co-opted Bagley's memory as an example of white manhood during one of the most vilely racist political campaigns in North Carolina history in 1898. In fact, Worth Bagley's name was put in the Democratic platform of 1898, okay, as an example of white manhood. His name was printed in newspaper articles that were, that were condemning the fusionists, saying that a man of Worth Bagley's character and caliber would not associate with them. Right? So it's not surprising that this, that this turned out to be that way. Um, more evidence even supports this case. Raleigh superintendent of schools came up with the idea to have the uh, city school-age children participate in the dedication ceremony by laying a flower at the base of the monument during the, during the procession. And he visited each of the city's white schools and t drilled them, told them, this is your job, this is what you're going to do. Did not visit any of the black schools, even the school that had donated, they had pulled their pennies together and donated a dollar to the fund. They contributed to the fund, but they were not invited to participate. Huge slap in the face. Huge slap in the face. Okay, especially since so many prominent North Carolina African Americans had supported this monument. Now, the ceremony itself was, um, they wanted to do it on May 11th, but the monument would not be ready in time. So they, did, they chose May 20th the, um, because it's a very significant date in North Carolina history. It's the anniversary of the Mecklenburg Resolves. It's also the anniversary of, the, um, of North Carolina's secession from the Union in 1861. Okay, but this, the importance of the ceremony goes beyond recognizing Bagley as a hero. It was establishing the place of the Old South in the official memory of Worth Bagley and the Spanish-American War, as well as building the foundation for a new South. 
Josephus Daniel spent weeks in the News and Observer stirring public sentiments. He argued that four of the most, uh, four of the most renowned heroes of the Spanish-American War, Worth Bagley, William Shipp, Victor Blue, and Richard Hobson were all born of the same fighting spirit as Southerners, especially North Carolinians, who fought in the American Revolution and the Civil War. This is where we start to see the Civil War drawn into the memory. Okay. Bagley and those other heroes of the present generation gave North Carolinians, quote, a new idea of what Dixie meant and what Yankee Doodle was. And the, and the monument dedication ceremony was the opportunity to recognize North Carolina's historical breadth and truth that the New South was fashioned from the old. Now, the parade of the Capitol was still, uh, similar, albeit smaller than the funeral that had taken place nine years earlier, but it had the same visual imagery of the blue and the gray reconciling. You had Confederate veterans and Union veterans walking, marching. Now, even though this war had taken place decades before, you still see elements of that Civil War take, uh, holding, holding on firm in this new memory creation. Okay? Now, Blue's speech was more of a eulogy of Worth Bagley, of what type of person he was, uh, how brave he was, and his sacrifice for the country. This is probably the eulogy they should have got at the funeral. Okay, now Hobson's speech delved right into the political realm. Nothing to do with Worth Bagley. Well, a little bit to do with Worth Bagley. Hobson told the crowd that the Spanish-American War had been America's graduation, turning it into a world power, but more specifically, one ruled by white supremacy. He argued that Worth Bagley was a prime example of, quote, the services of the Anglo-Saxon race, and that the purest of Anglo-Saxon blood is to be found in the southern states, unquote. He iterated the ideal version of the South in the same vein as Henry Grady's um, New South Creed, with the industrialization of the South while still clinging to antebellum social structures. And again, Worth Bagley was seen, it was used in this ceremony as the example of what man, Anglo-Saxon manhood and the... the um, the example, the example to emulate. But now, and this is where we're going to start getting to your question, Annie. Um, now that Bagley's place has been firmly submitted in the official memory, some North Carolinians seized on the opportunity to use Bagley to lobby for more Confederate commemoration. Within two months of the dedication ceremony, calls came from across the state to erect more statues. A prominent Johnston County farmer named John Michener penned an editorial where he, where he noted that on the Bethel battlefield in Virginia, Civil War, there was a marker to commemorate where Henry Lawson Wyatt died as the first Confederate casualty. Michener was offended by the fact that there was no monument or marker to recognize Wyatt's heroism in his own state. He believed that Worth Bagley was worthy of a monument, but, quote, we ought to not forget the first fallen in the more terrible conflict. Only nine years passed before Worth Bagley's monument was erected. It has been nearly 50 years since Wyatt fell, unquote. Thomas Clausen, the editor of the Wilmington Messenger, actually diminished Bagley's heroism. He said, quote, If the people of the state were willing to raise sufficient funds to erect a monument to Worth Bagley, who lost his life in the war of foreign invasion, surely they would be willing to do the same for one who gave up his life in defense of his state and the homes of his people. If Worth Bagley deserved a monument in the hands of the people of the state, surely Wyatt is ten times more worthy of the same honor to his memory. Unquote. The United Daughters of the Confederacy argue that since Bagley had a statue on the Capitol grounds, Wyatt's sacrifice, quote, in our greatest war, should be recognized and the state of North Carolina should be glad to bear part of the expense of a fitting memorial. Unquote. Such sentiments reveal that for some North Carolinians, the heroes of the Spanish-American War paled in comparison to the heroes of the Confederacy. The Bagleys, the Ships, the Blues, the Hobsons bridged the sectionless gap for white Southerners in a sense that the South could now worship their Southernness without causing a perceived slight or a threat to the Union. And that white Southerners preferred their Confederate heroes because those heroes were better, better stood for the values of the antebellum social order. Bagley's memory had served its purpose. It helped with the reunification of white Americans on Southern terms. 
With reconciliation accomplished, white North Carolinians could now worship their Confederate heroes and heritage more freely without fear of being labeled traitors. Bagley's blood had washed away the South Senate secession, and Southerners could point to Bagley's deed any time their Confederate commemoration drew criticism from, from Northernism. I'm from, sorry, from Northerns. Essentially, he was the South's bloody shirt. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it starts. So that's, your question has a very long answer. <laughs> All right, so in conclusion, the official and public memory of Worth Bagley as a Southern save, uh, Savior was developed and utilized to undermine and unravel the dissenting vernacular memories of the Civil War and Reconstruction eras, contributing to a consensus memory and a united collective identity amongst white North Carolinians. Newspaper men and the political elite appropriated Worth Bagley's body, his name, his funeral, and statue to try to develop a consensus among whites in North, Carol North Carolina, in the northern United States, and in the South, essentially wiping the slate clean and fostering reconciliationist sentiments. Are there any questions? Yes, Sydney. So we've brought up his age of being 24 a couple of times, and I was wondering, do you think him being so young was the reason he was a great martyr to co-opt? Absolutely, because the whole thing, I mean, especially back during this, this uh, Victorian era, you know, the most... Even go into any cemetery from the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. The most elaborate monuments you will see are those to young folks whose lives, whose lives were cut short. It's just a part of mourning. And he is just, it's easy to cling to. because It's easy to feel sympathy for because he was so young. He had his whole life and his whole future ahead of him. And he gave up his life for his country. Yeah. Do you also think him being so young, like, Imagine maybe, what if instead he was 34, right? He had, you know, lived a little bit longer, maybe is more politically prominent, maybe has spread his own ideas more. Do you think a, maybe also that young age is also an example of he was sort of a blank slate in which people could project their own beliefs onto? Sure, absolutely. I mean, he didn't have a record. He didn't have a career. I mean, his career... I think at his funeral, Victor Blue told, shared a story about Bagley playing a role in saving some fishermen who were caught in a storm. But other than that, he really didn't have a resume that you could draw. So, yeah, you could, you could pretty much say anything about him, right? So had, had he had a political career, they would have been kind of boxed in about what he, what he said, especially if he didn't support the Democratic Party. Him being related to Josephus Daniels probably would have. Um, in fact, you know, his grandfather was a member of, prominent member of it. Um, now, it doesn't mean that they agreed all the time. In fact, they, Josephus Daniel was actually anti-Spanish American War, anti-war in Cuba, while Worth Bagley took more of the idea of, uh, with this shield or upon it, I'm going. And a uh, very Spartan attitude. Great question. But we don't know. I can't say for sure because it didn't, it didn't turn out that way. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Based on... The speech is given at the dedication of the monument mm -hmm. and kind of the original reason for putting this monument up and what it represented. Has there been any talk about taking the monument down? That, no. I mean, it's interesting. The Wyatt, the Wyatt Monument has um, been taken down. Yeah. The Daughters of the Confederacy was actually, they actually used the um, Bagley as justification for erecting their monument to the women of the Confederacy. That's been taken down. I mean, it's all about... Well, one, most people don't know the history of it. I actually walked into a Dunkin' Donuts the other day. They had a, they had a mural of the, the, the NC Capitol. Yeah, Dunkin' Donuts. And his, his statue was right there. And I asked somebody, I was like, do you know who that is? I'm like, no. He looked at me like I was crazy and walked away. And so it's, but you go and look at it. it I mean, let's look at the statue. It's the seal of the U.S. Navy. It's a, it's a monument to an American sailor. Yep, it attaches yeah. those words yeah. to that monument, but then those words fade. Mm -hmm. Unless you were there, or unless you do the research, you don't know. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, why, that's why monument building was such a big thing, because it transmits a message across time and space, right? So those words that were spoken there basically did not stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, weren't in, they weren't inscribed in stone. But yes, when you look at it, but then again, that's also a product of 
the politics of the era, right? It had those it doesn't have a lot to do with Worth Bagley. Again, he was dead. We don't know what his politics would have been. Um, so that's a great question. People have you know, people have asked, you know, do you think this should be taken down? That's not for me to decide. I mean, if you just take it at face value, he's an American sailor. But then when you go go through and look at it deeper, you do see there are connections to white supremacy, connections connections to the Confederacy, but not one that the general public is aware of. All right. It was very clear what the Confederate monument that they tore down in the summer of 2020, because it had the seal of the Confederacy on it, right? But yeah, I mean, is def is it is it worth conversation? I'll leave that to to, to y'all to think about and to reflect on, and to write about. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I did have a question when you were quoting from Josephus Daniels. Um, he called it the Civil War. At what point did it become? The other name, right? The War of Northern Aggression. When did that kind of... That started immediately. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that was in... Um, oh, no, his name escapes me right now. But, uh, you know, the, the book, The Lost Cause, that was published in 1866, it's called it that. Okay. Right? So, I mean, that, and that was, that was a contemporary term. That's what they called it at the time. And it depends on, you know, a certain point of view, right? For, for some people, and, and the reasons why people fought the Civil War vary. I mean, the, we know, we, and we accept, at least in academia, that it was about slavery, um, you know, the, the, uh, the argument that they're defending states' rights, like, okay, well, what's the right that they're defending, uh, you know, the right to own another person? Um, but, yeah, that, that, that's, that's long been a term. That's not a, a modern term. Okay, okay. Any other questions? Great questions. All right. Well, I will let you all go. Um, and, again, if, if, you know, think when you're, when you're reflecting on Worth Bagley, think about him and this story in the context of what was going on in North Carolina at the time with the end of the fusion movement, um, the disenfranchisement of African-American voters, and the beginning of the progressive movement. Okay? All right. Thanks all, y'all. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>